All right, cool. We are back with another week of the state of e-commerce, uh, this time featuring Yoni Kosminski of Multiply Me. Uh, and as always, uh, your two co-hosts here, TJ Highland, myself and, and Ben Stein. But firstly, let's let's welcome in Yoni. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Excited to sit down and chat with you boys again. Of course. Uh, so a little bit of an overview of what we'll discuss today, or I guess background on, on Yoni first. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of Multiply Me, as well as Wildfire Creative. Um, you know, what they do is they really take on three different forms in regards to staffing, consulting, and, and digital marketing. Um, so they've really perfected uh, the source uh the form of using outsourced teams, uh, and they actually do that with full of full teams in the Philippines, um, basically, and they have leveraged their opportunities to help you guys uh, as sellers and as businesses. Um, so they're providing the best global talent, and Yoni's going to give a little bit of insight today on his own experience selling and growing a business, finding Multiply Me, and then maybe some other top tips uh, about how that all works. So a little bit of long one, but Yoni, welcome. That was awesome, mate. Thanks for the, uh, the, the, the kind words and the warm welcome. Um, I feel like I should probably just dive into uh, a little bit about my experience to build a little bit of credibility here and tell you guys kind of who I am and, and what I've been up to and, um, and really get into the content, which is sure. you know, the, the focus. So um, I spent uh, over a decade now in creative advertising, digital marketing, building strategy and execution for the likes of uh, Sony and MasterCard, Mercedes-Benz. For those of you outside of the US, uh, no one in America seems to know Mondelez Craft Foods, but they're an enormous confectionery company uh, globally. So um, that's been my career and I actually stepped into um, a consulting engagement for an Amazon business. Um, and I didn't realize that these three guys who were running the business were sitting on what was then $2 million in revenue. And uh, these guys didn't have a whole lot of experience in terms of digital marketing or advertising or, or really any of this that really was very impressive to see them grow it. So I stepped in and helped scale that business from two to 5 million in a 12 month period. And really what the approach was there is how do we reduce our operating costs and build an actual infrastructure that will allow for scale? So that was really kind of the start of my personal journey on, I guess, the discovery of just how talented um, or what the talent pool looks like in the Philippines and the fact that um, it's simply a lower cost of living, uh, but the delivery of work is, I would, I would argue, better, but at least on par to what I've had historically in Australia and the US and I'm sitting here from Tel Aviv, Israel today. So um, I guess when we talk about that, that scaling and how we did it inside of the Amazon uh, business, we built a team uh, in the Philippines that cost us about $15,000 a month to employ, which would have cost north of about $50,000 a month in the US to, to deliver the same team. Uh, we had everything. We had from a customer support team, which is you know fairly obvious to things that are a little bit less um, common. Like we had a whole production studio over there. So we would send product over, we'd handle our product photography. We worked with a number of, of suppliers that became kind of retainer clients. So we used and leveraged other agencies until we built our own. And that was kind of the starting point of the catalyst where it was a, a big aha moment for me um, in two lights. One is the notion of and I'll talk about it a little bit later is, is the working in your business versus on your business and how you can actually affect serious scale if you build things the right way and you invest the time. Um, and the other is, is obviously um, is the Philippines and how you can really leverage these incredibly talented um, people. And we're talking about a population of 110 million people here who most of them have a college degree or higher when we talk about the business process outsourcing, the BPO industry. Um, so uh, growing up speaking English and, and are delivering. So um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a little bit about the path of, of, of how that all happened. So what I did was uh, after finishing that engagement, I realized like what we'd done there was pretty game changing. And when I say we, I took my founding team with me. So when I started Multiply Me and you know, it was, it was how can we change other people's lives and how can we actually have the impact, not just from the staffing solution, but also from our consulting business to Scala, how can we actually help implement 
those processes that allow for, for serious scale. So um, pitched all of them. Um, and this was about 12 months ago. And <laughs> sitting here today, we've got about 60 people on our payroll um, where it's, it's a makeup mostly of the staffing and consulting businesses. And, you know, if we're here sitting here trying to be the experts on scale, then obviously we have to be growing faster than everyone else or at least on par. So, so you know, you know, you talked about growth, you talked about, you know, how this is hyper growth with an Amazon business truly operating with what sounds like a global company at, at a global scale. Um, can you dive into some of the lessons that you learned when scaling that business and how that translated into, you know, your, your work with Multiply Me and now Escala as a you know, consulting businesses for businesses that do want to scale and get bigger? Absolutely. Yeah. So for anyone out there listening, you know, and obviously all the pioneer customers and, and partners, everyone's dealing in e-commerce, online transactions, payment gap. I mean, you know, I don't need to tell the audience about pioneer, but, but um, in terms of key lessons learnt uh, when we talk about scaling an Amazon business, um, it's the lessons that we really preach um, inside of a Scala um, and one of the quotes that we love to use is if I had six hours to cut down a tree, I'd spend the first five sharpening my ax. And what that quote means to us as a business is how do we actually build the infrastructure that will allow for scale and not just growth where there's a difference. So um, growth being, you know, you can add more team members, grow the revenue and, you know, that more, more revenue doesn't necessarily mean more profit doesn't necessarily mean a better business. It, a lot of times it just means more headaches. Whereas when we talk about scale, it's about how do we do this effectively, affordably, and actually focus on our objective to do more with less and achieve that at scale. So that you don't need to bring on 10 new people for every new client. Imagine if you guys had to do that pioneer, you'd have, you'd have a fair few uh, employees. Um, so I guess one of the, one of the, one of the lessons is definitely planning. Um, and what we do is very specifically, a lot of it comes into the form of an audit where we look at what's actually happening in the business. So we'll assess the um, process flows and the maps of well, what are, what's everyone actually doing in the business and how do they interact? Where are the bottlenecks? Like understand what's happening in your business. Um, I would say another key lesson um, is be on top of your financials. Um, so, you know, for anyone looking to delve into the world of Amazon, what I will say is that, yeah, you could start off with maybe a twenty dollars or $30,000 investment, but the reality is it's capital intensive. So just be very cognizant of the fact that as you grow and you start doing, you know, from 50 to 100 to 5,000 units a month, um, that inherently is going to bring on um, cash flow issues or you need money to grow because you need to pay your suppliers. So just be on top of your financials. Um, and of course, I couldn't sit here and not tell you that the most important thing is your human capital. You know, without without having the right people and the right seats delivering uh, on everything that needs to be delivered on, I mean, you, you're pretty much um, you're pretty much doomed. So let's talk about the human capital aspect of it for a minute, because you know, I feel like there's sometimes a notion that if you hire an, a staffer from overseas, you're going to get less quality work, or you're going to get you know, what you pay for. And you obviously were talking about, you know, if you pay for it for staff in the Philippines, you'd get or at a cheaper rate than, than what mm -hmm. it is in the U S. So do you want to dive into a little bit about the, the, the quality of work and like what you've seen and what's worked best to, to ensure that quality is what you would get from, you know, someone in the U S or in Australia or, or wherever? Yes. Um, great question. Uh, and, and what I will say about that is, I mean, I can talk about us for a second right now when I talk about the team that we yeah, have. So. Um, the, the team that we have, for example, our, our consulting business is made up of all ex Ernst & Young and Accenture consultants. We're talking about 10, 15 consultants that are able to be deployed. These are the exact same people that you might, you might be paying five, seven, eight hundred $800 an hour for. Um, and for us, um, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it doesn't really make sense, especially when we're focused on helping grow businesses, that, right. you know, the, 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 the notion of, or the word consulting has become a pretty ugly word because it, to me, sounds expensive where we're trying to kind of change that. But, but looking at people and the quality of people, um, there's a few kind of words of warning, I'll say, um, 
you know, if I'm throwing out quotes here, uh, another one that I like is, uh, you know, if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. And so, you know, you get a lot of people saying, well, I got a Filipino for $350 a month. Why would I pay $1,000, $1,500 a month? And the question you really have to ask yourself is also like, you know, if we're getting into that, it's the, the notion of a VA and kind of creating someone who can do everything, a guy who can do WordPress and Illustrator and Photoshop and do videography. Like these unicorns don't exist in the Western world. Why, why on earth are you finding them in any of these <laughs> other, you know? So, so that's the reality. You, you can't, you, you need to invest the money and the time, but I'll, I'll take it one step further and say from our experience too, a lot of it sets, uh, sits on the onboarding and the actual management side of things. So it's hard enough to be a manager. You know, all of us are sitting here and we're all trying to be the best at e-commerce. TJ, we were speaking last week and you're like, well, there's, there's things around e-commerce that really interest me, like all of the audience. And, and what I'll say is that we're all sitting here investing time into being the best we can be at whatever it is that we're doing. Most people right. aren't trying to focus on being the best manager. And so when that responsibility shifts for you as, a, as an employer or as a manager, you've hired your first employee, whatever it looks like, you're hiring a whole team. It all comes down to making sure that the expectations are met. So defining the, what does success look like? What are the KPIs and responsibilities of the individual that you've hired and having clear communication to make sure that they deliver on expectation and vice versa. So we invest as much time training our uh, client partners, I would say sometimes even more so than our multipliers who we place in other businesses. Uh, I love the systems and data-driven approach that you're taking to scaling these businesses. You know, I think sometimes you'll you'll hear you know, Amazon sellers or frustrated sellers, people that have maybe hit that wall where they don't know what their goal is at the end right there, and they're just trying to scale and build and run as fast as possible, maybe run out of their shoes just because they don't know. They've run out of cash. They've run out of inventory. They've run out of supplies. They don't know where to turn next. Uh, you, you know, when sellers run into these issues, right, it seems like you need to put them into a system. You need to scale scale them you need to do it in a systematic way that'll actually give them some longevity in their business yeah absolutely i mean to that to that effect um we spent probably three to four months building the infrastructure to allow for it and now now we can see you know quote unquote exponential scale and we can take on i can sit here and have a com six months ago i couldn't have sat here and had a conversation with you guys because you know if we were inundated with potential leads it would be a disaster for the business and we're never going to compromise on quality but because you invest the time to, to scale, I will, press for, I will preface that with the fact that when we talk about Amazon selling, you know, you run out of inventory because you've had a spike. I mean, there's really, that's like, that's the worst thing that can happen is you're on a winning product and everyone wants to buy it and, you know, you've got the lead time. So that planning though, in understanding, you know, let's say you've got multiple suppliers, that planning that understands that, okay, the quality might be slightly compromised, but we can handle that for the two week turnaround period and you can be strategic in how you at least get products to market or, or bring them over to the U S and ensure that you're not going to lose. Um, you're not going to lose that ranking juice that is just so critical when we talk Amazon. I mean, we, we didn't, we didn't kind of go into um, it too much, but you know, when you ask me about some of the things I've learned um, and most Amazon sellers will know there's like three key areas when you launch product launch is the most important part of, of your life cycle when we talk about uh, bringing products to Amazon. Um, if you get that wrong, you're, you're, you're constantly fighting an uphill battle. And, you know, I can see you lying, laughing there, Ben, but um, it's, you know, it's just so the truth, it's isn't true. it? Yeah. It's true. You only get, exactly, right? So you only get one first impression. If you do it wrong the first time, you're going to have to go back to the drawing board and figure it out the second time. I'm sure that is the most daunting challenge for, for anyone, maybe even that barrier to entry too, if someone's considering, you know, launching their business. Yeah. So I would say like, if you're considering getting onto Amazon and having that as a, as a key platform, there's three, you know, Amazon will, will also dictate, or, you know, you do a little bit of research and you'll understand yourself. Like there's three key metrics that you have to get right when we talk about launch. And that's, you've got to make sure that you've got serious sales velocity and there's a million ways that you can approach how you can achieve that. Um, obviously, you know, all of us sitting here and everyone listening, you need reviews, right? You need to, you need to have a review strategy in place to ensure that that sales velocity matches the review count and you actually start to, um, you know, achieve that social proof and people actually continue to buy, you know, there's like a magic number. I would say, you know, 
arbitrarily around 100. You, you get to about 100 reviews and, and the tide starts to, to turn. So focus on, you know, it's about incremental improvement. Focus on getting to that 100 reviews and then think about the next step. So, you know, you, you kind of be, I need to be single-minded. And then, of course, uh, when we talk about Amazon FBA, where you already get a, um, it's advantageous, advantageous to, to use Amazon FBAs, you need to have inventory in stock. Amazon wants to make money just like everyone else. And if they know they have more products to sell, then they're obviously going to prioritize you as a top seller because they can make more money off you every time they make a sale. You just laid out a bunch of things seller has to consider, a bunch of things an entrepreneur has to think about. Their mind's probably racing. You know, they they go from one task, they go to the next. There's only 24 hours in the day. You have to eat, you have to sleep. It's you know, it's daunting to accomplish all this. Um, but I, I know something that you've talked about with Multiply Me is that you know the, the difference between working in your business and working on your business, and what you're alluding to is you know outsourcing some of that work. Uh, can you touch on that a little bit more, and you know how you have helped entrepreneurs grow? grow and scale their brands and businesses? Absolutely. So this might be the part of the segment where I where I chuck on a little presentation just because I've got it and I'm going to be reading off it or looking at it anyway. So why don't I why don't I jump on it? It's visually nice, so I approve. Okay. Well as long as I've got as long as I've got your approval, TJ, I'm going to go for it. Um, all you need. That's all I need, really in life. Um, so so hopefully this doesn't Yes, it's gone the right way. So um, very key, but subtle differences to what is working in your business versus on your business. And I guess one of the big things for me, and as we continue to grow and trying to manage that, um, that workload, you know, you've only got, like you were saying, Ben, you've only got so many hours in the day. And in order to achieve everything that you want to achieve, you really need to understand, especially for senior management or key players in your business, how do you make them as efficient as possible? And how do you get them working on the things and on your business rather than really deep inside of it? So like I was saying, very subtle difference between the two. But when you understand it and when you can actually start to see it, that really is for us like the, the first aha moment you need to move, move from from being kind of like the small business owner or when I say small business owner, I mean more of a mindset where like, investing money means that it's money that's not in my pocket it's money that i'm spending out there where you know if you really want to if you really want to scale a business you need to think of ways to leverage the talent you have in house and this is a really good way to to, to start looking at it so when we talk about working in your business um all of your focus really sits in those short term deliverables like what are we getting through today this week you know there's no foresight in it you're always dealing with urgent tasks so you're not getting to any of the stuff we've talked about around process improvement and process mapping. A lot of it is really dictated by the team and it's in a micromanagement uh, perspective. So you might have your managers or if you've got managers, it's really like a task orientated ecosystem um, and it's impossible to scale. There's just no way that if your business is very much built on people, um, you, you can really take to the next stage. So when we talk about working on your business and you can see here, very subtle differences. So instead of it being short term, we're delivering long term growth strategy around what's actually happening. You know, you're dealing with the important tasks and not the urgent. Still very relevant and what you need to be working on, but it's not. You're not putting out spot fires anymore. You're really trusting in your team members and believing that your middle management, senior management, can deliver the expectations placed upon them, and you know you're essentially ready to scale. So just to kind of hammer that point home as to how to go about it. Um, just if this is a new concept for you, it probably isn't, but just to kind of lay it all out there. So when you build a business where you're very hyper-focused inside of it, um, it's very risky because it's influenced very much by people's perspective and perspective change. A big part of our consulting business in Escala is to audit companies and individually interview different stakeholders to build the actual picture of what's going on there. So you know, when, you, when you're investing and if it's really built on key personnel, if those people leave, your business can really come to a standstill. So what you really want to be doing is focus on driving standards. So you set the KPIs that help dictate the tone and you empower your leadership to allow for that growth. And what you start to see is the actual reality of what you're creating because everyone's reporting back to you and giving you the insights you need. I mean, 
I'm not going to show you guys now, but you know, we were having chats earlier and talk about business. I mean, we've got a full-time data analyst working in, in the business. So I've got a dashboard that pulls in from our zero to our um, click up project management software to our recruitment CRM to, to everything that's going on to give us the health up to date around the business. And that for us is how we actually track. Are we on track? Are we not, not on track? So that's how we've really removed ourselves from working deep with inside the business. So um, I think also what's important to note is that even if you are going through these processes and you're sitting there and you're saying, well, that's me, shit, I can't get myself out of it. Um, every business needs to start out with an early concept and building that framework and getting the proof of concept. So you need to have people heavily invested. Like when we started this, we were all working so heavily inside of the business because you know, you'll always find that founders and early team members, they should know the business best because they've worked in every aspect of it before it was this big, you know, pioneer behemoth in the room. Um, see what I did there? And so, you know, don't be hard on yourself if you're sitting here and you're saying, well, yeah, we've got our proof of concept, we've built the framework where we're on the up and then we keep getting stuck in that urgent task. And then there's another urgent task and we can't actually, this is a very common growth trajectory. And this is one of the big elements that hold businesses back. Um, what we all want to see is what a healthy growth trajectory looks like. So once you actually prove out that concept, that's when you start to prepare for that scale. So that's when everything that, you know, that we do with a Scala, that's where it all becomes relevant. What's happening in the business, standard operating procedures, process improvement, training documentation. You don't want to have to have the same people coming back into the business, particularly senior management to train very simple things. And the excuse of, well, I can do it. So I'll just keep doing it. It's never really going to work for you as, as um, you know, as a business. So I guess, I mean, I don't know if we're going to get any live answers here, but I'm just going to kind of rattle it out for you guys. But, um, you know, I really, I really, I think sort of TJ and I can talk about that exactly is that the ability to take a step back, right. As a founder and as someone who's, you know, been a sole proprietor, sole operator in your business, probably one of those powerful things that, that I'm sure that you can do as a business owner, entrepreneur to focus on exactly what you're saying, you know, driving the business forward strategically thinking, you know, not on the next task or the next cycle or the next buy, but thinking, you know, two, three, four buys beyond that, maybe even the next holiday season or how you can, um, you know, recent on the pioneer perspective, right? It's how you can take your business that's been successful in your own home market or your own domestic market and scale that to Australia, to the United, to the United Kingdom, to Japan, to, you know, somewhere overseas, to South America. Um, and, and I think that probably has to be one of the most powerful things to these sellers since they can actually take that step back and say, here's what I've built. Now let me grow this and, and make this profitable. Yeah, it's the, it's the old rinse repeat method. Um, where, you know, that's how you start to, you know, growth is expensive and the start of any business is expensive. But as you start to deliver the same deliverable after same deliverable, then you hope that, you know, your plus minus 20, 30%, depending on the engagement. And if you're lucky and you're a pioneer solution, you, you literally are delivering the same thing more or less over and over and therefore in their specific business units and it becomes a very scalable solution. You know, when we talk about scale, you know, in terms of multiply me and Escala, you know, there's scaling with people, but there's also scaling with systems. Um, and how do you, how do you find the right balance of, of when you have use a, a new software, a new solution versus hiring someone else to do a task? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so oh, I asked it. Yeah, no, I know. I know you've, you've behind the scenes guys. The idea was how can TJ stump me? So uh, we'll see if he gets me here, but uh, is that a, is that a term you guys use stump? It's a yeah. cricket. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so how do you decide whether you scale the business with people or with systems? How do you make a decision around uh, whether it's technology? Like what's the approach? Is that kind of the question? Yeah. Just, you know, when you're, you definitely reach a point in your business where you realize you need something, how do you determine whether that something is someone or, you know, to find a different accounting software so you're not doing everything so manually or to find a, a you know, repricing tool or something like that, if we're talking about your Amazon business versus hiring someone, say, in the Philippines to help or manually do that repricing? Yeah. So for me personally, I've got the luxury of having a consulting business. So we treat Multiply Me and Escala 
and wildfire as our own clients. So we get audited. I've been audited um, multiple times now uh, in the sales function and in the marketing department. And, you know, it's all, it's always, they ask the same questions, right? They've got a serious, we've got a, a maturity framework and methodology based on well, what's happening in the business. Where are the bottlenecks? You know, the idea is always, how do I remove myself as quickly as possible from things that don't need to be me that delivers on them? So, you know, if we're talking about making a decision over technology versus staffing versus, you really have to ask the right questions as to what, what, you know, we essentially, you know, in a, if I was to kind of um, water it down and make it really simple, it's, 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 it's building the cost benefit analysis or the breakdown of what's happening, who needs to be involved and what's the most strategic and cost effective way to achieve that. You know, when we talk about consulting too, our, our initial objective, and it should be for every business owner out there is how do we not invest more money into creating more people, more teams, you know, throwing people and money at solutions is not, is not a solve at all. It's what can we do with the existing team to maximize their output without investing another dollar? Like that's the, you know, when we talk about, you can't have a single call or meeting or anything like that without mentioning COVID. Um, but, you know, it really is current and on everyone's mind, just how tough it is right now. Um, trying to find ways to pair back costs and find solutions. So, you know, at my first position is always let's not just because we have a solution that's a staffing solution doesn't mean let's put people and throw people at the problem. Like how do we save money and reinvest it intelligently? My favorite moment, uh, I would say in, in all of our engagements, particularly around consulting is when we deliver our midway point. And typically speaking, we've identified usually uh, more money in savings around uh, wastage or loss or poor process or wasted software or technology that was being used to cover the engagement itself. So I think the first thing is um, what's the cost and impact in the business and how many people need it? I mean, it, you know, it's a bit of a loaded question. Maybe you've stumped me a little bit. I don't know. No, no, no. I think you got it. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's just a, in my eyes, a, you know, I would think that you know, hiring someone would be more expensive than, than, you know, applying a, a system or a tool yet that someone is an actual person who understands your business could help in, in other ways and, and realize how that aspect that they're tasked with working on connects with the rest of your business, where if you just take on a, a software or a solution, you know, you're getting a result, but you're getting just that. Uh, so no so I, creativity. I would, yeah. So I would say, I would say as well, like it depends on what that individual costs you. I give you an example for us. We actually, we're now using HubSpot. Um, but before mm -hmm. that we used Zoho and Zoho was a much cheaper option. Um, we've, you know, uh, outgrown it or it's not really the right fit for us anymore. So we moved over to HubSpot and another recruitment CRM. And the decision as to why we didn't go to HubSpot is because for a, I think a two thousand or three thousand dollar investment plus the ongoing fees around it, we could have brought in you know a team member or two. It right. didn't make sense. I'd rather invest people and throw people at the problem, um, and come up with much more intelligent ways to expand and have that creativity and that problem solving as opposed to bringing in a technology where ultimately it was going to be the the outcome. We were going to do an audit of which things made sense for the business, but. Again, it depends on your maturity state. You don't need to get the best and shiniest and most expensive. You know, you want to deal with things when you're there at that point in time, not because that's the, you know, the, I was going to use such a terrible one, the Rolls Royce of, you know, uh, solutions. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, you want to, you want to kind of meet, meet the business where it's at and what it can afford. Um, and if it's people, I, I'm always going to invest in my people first. Right. Um, for me, that's where the magic happens, you know, sitting in the seat that I sit in, it's way more important that the team achieve more than I do. I just have to simply, you know, my, I've done my job if they're all delivering on theirs. And, you know, Yoni, I think that's a great way to wrap up this, you know, conversation we've had is that you know, there are a lot of different options out there to scale. There are a lot of different things an entrepreneur and a business leader has to consider and not all of them are going to be right solutions whether it's investing in the people or the systems or thinking about planning or the right way to work on your business rather than in your business. Uh, but it, it sounds like really that's where Multiply Me can come in and a scholar can come in and, and help it audit these, uh, these companies as they look to grow. 
Absolutely. I'll actually, I'll actually give you. A, I didn't actually show you the final slide here, so we've been sitting on it for a minute. Um, <laughs> but it, it's a test that we love to ask people because this really gives you an insight of kind of where you at in terms of mm-hmm. being ready for scale. So, um, for anyone watching out there, these were the answers. So, if you were, if you were to walk away, you know, if something were to happen, you didn't go back into work because you just you couldn't be bothered anymore. Um, if it was a week that the business would survive uh, in that operation, you're actually pretty healthy. Um, if you have enough process in place to allow for someone to, to, to go in there and kind of figure out what's going on, that's great. Two weeks, I mean, super strong. Like that's a really impressive and scalable and I would even argue potentially saleable depending on how many functions can do that. You know, obviously, depending on where you're at, you know, you want a scalable or a saleable solution. Even if you don't want to sell it, that's the dream um, where someone can come in literally read your documentation and operate the business within, you know, a very short period. If it's less than one week, um, yeah, then uh, you should probably come and chat to us. <laughs> um, if it's less than one week, it just means that you're putting out spot fires. And I guarantee that if that's your answer, your work is not as enjoyable as it could be. And although it's work and not everyone has the passion that, you know, maybe I do or others do about what they do every day, um, it still doesn't need to be a drag and it doesn't need to be something that you, you know, you resent. For sure. So, so Yoni, you mentioned if people are in, in that less than one week range, they can come talk to you. So, so how would someone get in touch with you, Yoni? Yeah. So you can reach out to us right now on our multiply me website. Um, we will have an Escala website live end of the month, start of next month. So that's really exciting. And yeah, typically speaking, um, in terms of our, our, our solutions, yeah, Multiply Me, we are an offshore staffing solution. We help really find the best talent in the Philippines. And the focus is really not just on placing talent. There's a million recruitment agencies and you know, there's a lot of other great solutions as well. Like I'll give some of, the, some of our direct or indirect competitors a plug. You know, If you're not ready to take the plunge and scale your business, maybe you want to try out freelancers you know you've got great platforms like upwork and fiverr and free up and things of that nature um but when you want to take it to the next level um and and really the challenge that we identified it's it's not just about finding that talent so you know we're putting together the job description with our recruitment team of experts understanding who you need they're vetting them going through five rounds of interview you only need to get on the call once we've identified the top three and you get a nice little pretty packet where it tells you everything about their work history. You'll sit on the call with our recruitment team. And then we also build the onboarding plan and we handle the performance management. It's a really, you know, we call it like a concierge experience for, um, for staffing. We handle all the messy stuff. And I actually could never get on, on any discussion and not, not call out that our, our business is predicated on social mission. So for us, we pay healthcare, social security, HMO, Phil Health, 13th month, Pagibig, which allows people to borrow money against the business and or at least, you know, show that we're accredited. And the idea is that like, you know, for, for those people watching out there, um, $350 a month for a Filipino is not a good salary. Um, so don't buy what people are telling you. Um, I, you know, I can tell you, you know, we're looking at more than double that as our lowest paid employee plus benefits. And so just to give you kind of that idea is that um, we're here to find the best talent and a really great way that we started and how it even came to be with Escala was that um, understanding what's happening in the business. So the way I love to kind of um, communicate consulting for those, you know, we're we're playing in the SME market. We're really focused on helping e-commerce, Amazon and marketing teams uh, scale. And that's really our sweet spot. So we'll ask uh, questions about understanding, well, what's actually happening in the business? And we treat it as like a, call it like a doctor patient relationship. Like we're like a a therapist for the business. So any of the problems you have, any of the issues or any of the good stuff, you just need to talk to us. And what we'll do is we'll have, we're an independent body that assesses. So the more information we get, the more we can help you. And, you know, it's really, it's, it can be a pretty um, daunting experience you know for a lot of people running their businesses they've never let someone they've never given someone the keys to drive um right. so you know we're very cognizant of the fact that it's a it's a very finicky game that we play here um but um 
our focus really is like, you know, we, we build things like go to market strategy for Amazon products or is Amazon, is it vendor central or seller central or is it through a wholesale partner or should you go to an agency? You know, we can help companies do that. We help actually work with a lot of, I think I was saying seven and eight figure Amazon sellers in auditing, restructuring and building out their Amazon teams more effectively. You know, obviously with a focus on the Philippines, we can help with the, with the talent sourcing and reduce operating costs, but it, it's a whole lot more than that. It, it, it really comes down to things like the financial planning and understanding the viability of product launch. And, you know, is it going to be six months, nine months, a year until we start seeing real upticks in, in what's happening? I mean, I can keep going on about this forever, but I think, uh, I think I've answered the question that you were, um, you were hoping to hear. No, it's perfect. I, think- I mean, I, I love the analogy you said about, you know, the patient doctor relationship. And I, I think yeah. if, you know, sellers and entrepreneurs take that mindset and really have you know open themselves up and you know not maybe give them the keys to the the kingdom initially but uh, you know work with whether it be multiply me or other solutions out there to help uh you know scale their businesses they're going to find great results absolutely cool so we've gone uh, a little bit long this week which is totally fine yoni i think you dropped a lot of knowledge on on us about this about how you got started and you know what you're ultimately working towards. Uh, and I think it's a pretty cool product and it's pretty cool uh, for, for people globally. Um, so as Yoni said, if anybody wants to get in touch with him, you can reach him uh, on the Multiply Me website, which is multiplymii.com. That's correct. Um, I TJ, pulled TJ that out, for the win. Pulled that out. I don't even have it up. That was a good That's guess. Good. Good, brand, good brand recall there. So I'll, uh, I'll take it. <laughs> All right, cool, Yoni. I really appreciate it. Next week, we have Mike from AMZ Advisors joining us. Uh, So same time, same place for Ben and myself. Thank you very much. Yoni, you've been awesome. I appreciate you bringing your gold microphone on for this. (laughs) I was wondering if you're going to call me out on that. Yeah, we had a a good laugh about it. But thank you guys uh, a lot. It was great chatting with you and uh, look forward to doing it again soon. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Yoni.